So moving forward, um, as I mentioned before, throughout the day, one of the themes that has transcended is this idea of history. And, um, and I think that's where, that, that's the point of commencement for this last session. So history is a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. The role of history is to tell people what they have been, where they have been, where they still must go, and what they still must be. But before we explore where we still must go and what we still must be, I will reflect on a little bit of history. October 2016 signaled the commencement of a developing conversation around race and belonging at this University of Kent. When as part of our inspirational speakers program, the esteemed professor Robbie Shillian presented a lecture called The Aims and Methods of a Neoliberal Education through the notes of a 19th century Pan-African thinker, Edward Blyden. Shilliam noted, there has been insufficient acknowledgement that modern liberal education wishes to suture and save a public culture that is racially, racially exclusionary and is complicit in committing epistemic injustice. But how did we get to this moment? A moment that can only be understood by placing it within the wider historical and structural context that normalizes inequality. According to Dr. Jace Nardi, much of the insidious racism that transpires throughout the ac academy is facilitated through racial microaggression, while Lord Robbins, in stating his fourth aim of higher education, declared, once the reserve of the privileged few, higher education now has to perform a role in ameliorating social inequalities in an age that had set itself the ideal of equality of opportunity. And this was back in 1963. Still, where must we be? Students are becoming more culturally cognizant, demanding a recuration of the curricula to redress its narrow perspective. Fueled by epistemic injustice, epistemic violence, and a narcissistic desire to maintain exclusory structures. Shilliam recommends that epistemic justice calls for a reckoning with the racialized inequalities of knowledge cultivated within this history and has history accompanied the European colonial project. If we are to decolonize these exclusionary spaces and structures in these times of explicit racial violence, we need to bring the fire now. If we are to transform academia and ameliorate the others from their narratively condemned status, we need the fire now. We need anti-racist scholarship in times of explicit racial violence. Therefore, please join me in welcoming Dr. Aziza Johnson, postdoctoral fellow in geography at Queen Mary's University of London, And Dr. Remy Joseph Salisbury, <laughs> Presidential Fellow in Ethnic Inequalities at the University of Manchester, who are here to bring the fire now. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it's been such an amazing day. Um, I'm going to quickly say a couple of things first. If you have anything you want to add? Cool. Um, so first of all, like, um, we really should just pack up and leave after Sahima spoke, spoke, you know what I mean? Like, we ain't got nothing else to add. Like, we're just, we're just, we're just sharing our words now. Um, and also just to, like, again, speak, it, like, I mean, I know everyone said that the students have been amazing. But the students really have been amazing. And one of you, I think, said that, oh, you know, you, like, um, academic staff, Need to go down, like you need to go to your go down to your level, but like Remy, like shout it out. Actually, the problem is that we need to be raised to your level because you guys are doing work that we're not doing, um, that academics are not doing at this point in time, um, and so that's really the inspiration that we get from being in these spaces. And as grateful as we are that you're willing to that you, you know, that we get to see a Fly Girls Guide to University and the Fire Now, I think it's also important to recognize the amazing work that is about to come out with Francesca's, I know, I know, you didn't see that one coming. But Francesca has an edited collection
collection with Akugo coming out um, called To Exist is to Resist, Black Feminism in Europe, which is going to be fire and amazing. Um, so I'm really excited for that one to come out this fall. OK, so now we're going to read out like extra like parts of our introduction um, just as a way to kind of, yeah, like get us into these con conversations and also feedback on some things that we've spoken about today. Um, does that sound good? Do you wanna... Just to say that we've seen today that it's the students bringing the fire, so we're yeah. just here to support and yeah, uh, let's keep in contact and we'll support you as much as we can. Okay, um, so we begin with the words of James Baldwin. At the, and at the center of this dreadful, dreadful storm, this vast confusion, stand the black people of this nation, who must now share the fate of a nation that has never accepted them, to which they were brought in chains. Well, if this is so, one has no choice but to do all in one's power to change that fate for the sake of one's children in order to minimize um, the bill that they must pay. One must be careful to, not to take refuge in any delusion. And the value placed on the color of skin is always and forever a delusion. So the UK government's quest to make Britain, in the words of Theresa May, an increasingly hostile environment. Donald Trump's Muslim bans and continuous silence in the face of public white supremacist movements, inhumane immigration policies and detention centers, racist criminal injustice systems. These are just some of the marks of the virulent ex explicit racist um, racial violence that characterize contemporary societies. This book is born out of our sense that we, as anti-racist scholars and activists, must bear witness to these times of explicit racial violence. We, we must work towards changing our fates within the fire now. In this introduction, we as editors reflect upon the urgency that brought this book into existence. This sets up the themes that we collectively were keen to explore throughout the book. As we do so, we connect anti-racism across disciplinary and national, national boundaries. So by foregrounding the, these times of explicit racial violence um, as a continuation of that which came before, this book takes up Christina Sharp's framing of the past, which is not the past in uh, her book, In the Way, which is like just everything, everything you need it to be, it is. Um, but yeah, so these living histories kind of inform our understanding of the places that surround and are a part of us. So in Christina Sharp's own words, living in the wake means living the history and present of terror from slavery to the present as the ground of our everyday black existence, living the historically and geographically discontinuous but always present and endlessly reinvigorated brutality um, in and on our bodies while even, the ter while even as that terror is visited on our bodies, the realities of that terror is erased. So the fire now allows us to expose these terrifying and terrorizing realities. This is a reflexive study of racism's dynamism, its ever-mutating forms. The rise of Trump and, Bre and the Brexit referendum are symbolic of our entry into an epoch that is both a continuation of and, a ca and characteristically different from that which came before. This is about taking stock and bearing witness to the racial conditions in which we find ourselves um, and in doing so, we bring together a range of scholars and activists who share our sense of urgency um, and our desire to speak back. We hope that the reader sees this as a collection, uh, like sees this collection as a handbook for those undertaking or thinking about undertaking anti-racist work in urgently racist times. In The Fire Next Time, the book from which this work was inspired, James Baldwin wrote with his nephew front and center. Similarly, this is a personal book written to and for those we love, many of whom are outside of academia's walls. It is because of this that we begin by the, this book by addressing the role of academia in reproducing white supremacy. As academics connected to wider communities, we write consciously of these institutions and our institutional privilege. We write to make sense of this moment as the speed at which these unrelenting, traumatizing events are unfolding has been breathtaking, requiring new frameworks that seem constantly behind current events. We write to try to put a, a finger on ideas that have, that's, sorry, we write to try to put a finger on ideas which are nameless and formless, about to be birthed but already felt. We write because we are simultaneously tired, afraid, and angry. This writing is also shaped by the different ways the fire now reflects the urgency of this particular moment. 
We write from the ashes and embers of Grenfell Tower, where fire so quickly engulfed so many of our working class siblings in the UK. We write knowing that those deaths were a predictable and foreseeable consequence of a society that devalues black, brown, and working class bodies. While a 10 million pound regeneration project sought to superficially clad over the visible inequity manifest in the tower structure, um, we know it is that very cladding erected to aesthetically please or not disturb the occupants of nearby flats, like nearby luxury flats, um, that saw those flames rise so quickly. We write knowing the fire was not random, it is but symptomatic of much larger fires and a warning of fires to come. We think through this elemental fire as we watch our people battle for clean water in flint and standing rock, and as we watch, heartbroken, by the ever-increasing climate disasters killing people of color across the globe. We foreground the fires that have left so many of our countries torn apart by new imperialist wars, and the fiery right-wing rhetoric that, has te that continues to terrorize and silence so many of us within our daily lives. Yet we also hold on to a fire that is cleansing, that comes from speaking up and out against the violence that surrounds us. We write the fire now because we recognize that our silence will not save us and that our anger has its uses. We write with fire. The urgency of thinking about these issues is far reaching. Whilst we include scholars from the UK and the US, we're also purposeful in centering voices from outside of these contexts generally and beyond the West particularly. It's important to recognize how this book stems from a desire to respond to the rising fascism across the West overlooking the upsurge in fire-rate right-wing politics and oppression outside of the West. To truly discuss the fire now, we must move beyond an understanding of white supremacy as so that located within the Western Hemisphere. We know that, in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We know too that the impacts of Trump and Brexit reach far beyond the US and the UK, and the social, social political conditions that gave rise to Trump and Brexit are not confined within UK and US shows. It's here, in thinking about the politics of spatiality, that we see various privileges come to the fore. Without minimizing the pain and trauma facing people of color in the West, we also need to realize that this pain and trauma often does not go unseen by people of color in other geopolitical contexts. For those of, us, those of us that are siblings outside of the West, we say the names, retweet and amplify the hashtags, and march the streets, but this is often unreciprocated. As editors, we were intentional about speaking across difference and including as many voices as possible, particularly the voices that are assumed to be marginal to these conversations. We must recognize that there is a privilege in even being able to write or having the headspace to do so, not only does writing in the context of a blazing fire require a room of one's own and the ability to calmly sit and write as the fires blaze, it also requires a lot of invisible labor putting out of the fires, whether that political labor is enacted by the people cooking or washing up, opening their homes to those on the run, burping the babies, or the labor of needing to deal with other more pressing physical, mental, and emotional conditions. This is an observation of the mundane, but one that bears repeating, as it is often the sort of labor that falls on working class women of color, who then end up being unable to contribute to collections such as the fire now. It bears repeating because as the people of color most marginalized are putting out with the fires, questions of disability, mental health, food and queer politics fall by the wayside, while the most masculine presenting and respectable forms of activism are the narratives that get centered. What does it mean then for us to have put together a book on anti-racist scholarship and not have trans voices represented? To know that many of our siblings are locked up in punitive penitentiary systems and yet not speak of prison abolition. To not have explicit discussions about food, especially considering the majority of those who are facing systemic hunger and environmental racism are working class people of color or to have few pieces that speak explicitly to various forms of ableism and the multiple voices that exist outside of the Western Hemisphere. These are limitations that we feel clean, keenly, and we hope that those coming after us can speak more explicitly 
to these and other urgent questions. As Carter would remind us, the ellipses of our work are always implied. So as an interdisciplinary, international collection, the chapters in the book represent a diversity of approaches and viewpoints and reflect a vast range of positionalities. As editors, each with our own experiences and positionalities, we have pushed and challenged each other. Uh, our continuous dialoguing, characterised by love and friendship, has encouraged an ongoing process of reflexivity that has seen not only the refinement of our own work, but of this edited collection. So what unites the chapters is a commitment to bearing witness for social change. Whilst the chapters intersect and interact in so many ways, the book is structured into four parts. The first part is on transforming academia. The second part, intersectional identities, intersectional struggles. The third part, lessons from history, connections across spaces. And finally, understanding and reframing oppression. So we began by talking about this book as being written to those we love. And we end the book, but not the discussion, with a letter that centers our loved ones in the fire with us, with all the tenderness and love that we feel for them. The sort of letter that is begun five times and torn up five times. The political is personal, filled with faces, names, stories, laughter, and the tears shed invisibly that no hand can wipe away. Not all of us make it out of the fire. This isn't a cute metaphor, so may this book be one more way through which you, our loved ones, are spared and perhaps survive.